I have to ask you not to gong like that. Oh, well, uh, it's yeah. Not but... right in my ear, man. Well, I was just trying it's to... It's too piercing, man. It's too piercing. Well, see, the gong was to separate me from the commercials you just heard. I mean, I don't want people to think I'm a cigarette or a used car. <laughs> well, what are you, man? I'm Stan Freebird. Too piercing, man. Too piercing, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the brakes. Hit it, Billy. <laughs> Hollywood, we present the Stan Freebird Show. With the music of Billy Mayer. Plus the songs of Peggy Taylor with Doris Butler, June Foray, Peter Leeds, and Judd Conlon, Rhythm Air. You may not find us on your TV, because in case you did not know, we're being brought to you on. Brought to you on. Brought to you on. Now one of the dramatic scenes we know you've been waiting for. The stage lights dim, and the spotlight finds our announcer, Burnside Mantle. Thank you. Great moments in history. We bring you the story behind these moments. The time is April the 18th, 1775. The place, Charleston, Massachusetts. It is night, and high in the steeple of the Old North Church, two lanterns are gleaming. One if by land, and two if by sea. The British are coming. Quick, quick, Paul Revere, quick. The British are coming. Get on the horse. First you give me the money, then I'll get on the horse. <laughs> So concludes another gem from the files of our historical stool pigeon and uh, research man, Robert E. Tainter. Uh, Bob had to mail his expose in today as he's been temporarily detained. I hope they at least put a radio in his cell so he can hear the show. <laughs> and as for to all the hundreds of letters we've received uh, asking just exactly what yogurt is, uh, I'm sorry, we don't know. Uh, pardon but... me. Uh... Oh, yes, uh, Peggy? Well, yogurt, a dairy product, is prepared from milk partly evaporated and fermented by Lactobacillus vulgarius. Uh-huh. And for you true lovers of cupcakes and other goodies, that was the voice of Peggy Taylor. <laughs> See, how did you know what yogurt was? Oh, I know a lot of little things, Dan. Mm -hmm. You want to know the population of Winnetka? No, that won't be necessary. Uh, just glad you could drop by, Peggy. See, you look as pretty and perky. Dan, uh... Why don't you just let me sing, huh? Now, with the help of Judd Collins' rhythm airs, here's Peggy Taylor. Sing, Peggy. All right, Jack. <laughs> I like the likes of you, I like the things you do, I mean, I like the likes of you, I like your eyes of blue, I think they're blue, don't you, I mean, I like your eyes of blue. Dear, if I could only say what I mean, I mean if I could mean what I say, that is I mean to say that I mean to say that, I like the likes of you, your looks are pure to look, look like I like the likes of you.
Just what does it all mean? We are fortunate to have with us the eminent electronics engineer and scientist, Dr. Herman Horn, who will demonstrate for us the meaning of the word hi-fi. Uh, thank you. And incidentally, hi-fi is uh, two words hyphenated in the middle. <laughs> the word hi-fi, two words. Now, I've told you once. I won't tell you again. <laughs> the words hi-fi. Better. had become a part of our daily vocabulary. Still, many people do not completely understand. And so, it is to them that this lecture is dedicated. Doctor, one moment, please. <laughs> Just testing the equipment so I'll be ready for the lecture if that big fat mouth of yours ever stops flapping and you introduce me. <laughs> I I'm trying to. Well, try a little harder. Yes. Please. Hmm. Well, as Edison was to the incandescent lamp, as Whitney was to the cotton gin, as Abby is to rents, so is Dr. Herman Horn to stereophrantic, orthopedic, cinema ramophonic sound is the copyrighted name for my own personal hi-fi system, <laughs> which I have <laughs> developed. What the good doctor really means is... Hi-fi, short for high fidelity, or music recorded with complete frequency and full dynamic range, plus great musical balance, then engineered and pressed with critical electronic precision. Somebody asked you to say that? <laughs> oh, nobody Just said uh, it. thought you'd throw it in, is that it? Oh, yes, that it? I just wanted to help, you know. I well, that's very it. nice. You want to help. Say, let me show you how it can be a real help. Take your foot and put it in this bucket of salt water. All righty. There we are. Now, will you hang on to these two electrodes? All righty. Thank you. Hold it. <laughs> to continue, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> here is some average sound you hear every day around the house, which my assistant, Mr. Strudelmeyer, is going to play through hi-fi. Listen. That was the mating call of the aardvark. Uh, yes, you aardvarks with hi-fi sets, that was a good place in the record to test your equipment and get jollies at the same time. <laughs> Listen again. You know what that was? That was the same mating call, only played backwards and slowed down. <laughs> Uh, it is no longer attractive to aardvarks in this condition, but it gives my assistant Strudelmeyer goosebumps. <laughs> Here is something you don't hear every day. That was the sound of Luella Parsons at the Brown Derby putting ketchup on a clam sandwich in hi-fi. <laughs> hey, you'd think you were right there with Lolly, wouldn't you? I tell you, somebody who appreciates hi-fi, that's a dog. They could hear all the good sounds you couldn't hear. Like all the highs. You can only hear the fives. <laughs> the average dog can hear up to 40,000 cycles. Uh, I'll play an oscillator for you. You write down a mental note of where you can't hear anymore. You don't hear that, do you? That's the part the dogs like. <laughs> Don't you wish you had dog's ears? Matter of fact, a friend of mine back in Scranton got so mad that his dog could hear more than he could, he went to a plastic surgeon and had dog's ears put on him. <laughs> he couldn't hear for sour apples, but he got a part in the picture, Frankenstein meets the wolf man. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, yes, dog. I have recorded a whole symphony at 40,000 cycles for only dogs to hear. If you can hear it, believe me, worry a little. <laughs> All righty, put on the record, Sudermeyer. <laughs> Down, Sudermeyer. Down, Sudermeyer. Take the record off. Oh, too bad. They get too emotional. Sudermeyer. 
Strudemeyer, the liver is for them. <laughs> so concludes the first of a series of fascinating lectures on Hi-Fi by Dr. Herman Horn. I feel sure that you, like us, will get a lot from these educational talks. <laughs> The preceding four minutes of time has been relinquished by Stan Freeberg in honor of Deafen Your Neighbors Week. <laughs> the Lux Audio Theater. Brought to you by Lock Soap, the only salmon-shaped bar that swims up tub. <laughs> and now, here is your host, that grand, grand star with a wide, wide smile, C.B. Digby. Good evening from Hollywood. <laughs> Tonight we have for you a stirring psychological drama adapted especially for the Lox Audio Theater from that lovable motion picture, Rock Around My Nose. <laughs> Our stars are the screen's most lovable old codger, Mr. Evanston, Illinois. <laughs> and that delightful child actor, Bobby Finster, recently starred in Pillow Fight at the OK Nursery School. <laughs> As usual, after our play, I'll be talking with these glamorous stars in our very own green room. And now, from Hollywood, the Lux Audio Theater presents Rock Around My Nose. In the library of his palatial mansion, on his magnificent estate in Puce Hills, Connecticut. A troubled man sits aimlessly playing with his fabulous collection of pigeon blood rubies. As the priceless gems trickle from his aimless fingers and spill to the floor to be sucked on by a delighted cocker spaniel, <laughs> Foster Farthington Chatsworth III, the lonely millionaire, is thinking deeply. He is... But let him tell us his problem. I have lost all hope of getting close to my son, Julius Chatsworth IV. Since Julius was a baby, I've, I've had trouble getting close to him. Dad. And now... Dad. Ah, there is Julius now. Julius, my son, come get close to me. Are you kidding? <laughs> What's the matter, son? Let me get close to you, boy. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Why you can't get close to me. What is it? Well, Dad, it's just as plain as the... Oh, what's the use? I, I can't tell you. So long, Dad. Julius, well, where are you going? I'm going out to pick up a girl. But, Julius, <laughs> what about your poor old father? You get your own girl. <laughs> he was gone, and I still could not get close to him. Little did I know what was going on at the Puce Hills Sweet Shop. Hiya, Julius. Oh, hi, Marty. Uh, how's things at the butcher shop? Oh, I managed to do a little cutting up. <laughs> <laughs> how's with you? Oh, the same old thing. Come down here, drinking straight shots, talk realistic dialogue. I'm not getting any younger. I made a mockery of my life. I want to get married. But you're only eight years old. <laughs> oh, you're always throwing that in my face. <laughs> What's the matter? You cold? No, I'm struggling inwardly. <laughs> Julius began to spend night after night at the Puce Hills sweet shop. I could no longer interest him in a hobby, so I took up a hobby. I began to study golf. And one day at the country club, as I was taking a lesson from the pro... No, 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 Mr. Chatsworth. No, you, you sliced again. You've got to keep your eye on the ball. Yes, I know, but that's very difficult, Mac. 
My nose overshadowed it. I... Hmm, you got a pretty big proboscis. It is a bit outside, isn't it? Ooh, I wish I had that nose full of knickers. <laughs> that nose full of nickels. I had heard that phrase before, walking along the street. Hey, Kurt, get a load of that bugle. Boy, would I like to have that nose full of nickels. Nose full of nickels. Stop it! I I began to think about my nose. How many nickels would it hold? I decided to find out in my office next day. Here are the nickels, Mr. Chatsworth. Banks and all they have. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent, Miss Braintree. <clears throat> now I want you to pour them into my nose. Are you kidding? <laughs> Not at all. I want to see how many nickels my nose will hold. Well, you're the boss. Uh, say, you'll have to stand on your head. All right. <clears throat> yep. How's this? Perfect. All right. Start pouring. Okay. I guess that does it. You can stand up now. Okay. <laughs> All right. Start counting, Miss Braintree. <laughs> when the final count was in, I learned something new about myself. The number of nickels that my nose could accommodate amounted to $241.73. That 73 cents bothered me. Oh, well. That night in our drawing room, I confided in my wife, Mrs. Foster Chatsworth III. Foster the third, that's it. What? That's why you can't get close to your son, Julius. It's your nose. <laughs> Remember when you used to pick him up from the cradle, you couldn't see him? By <laughs> thunder, I think you've hit it. And now that he's grown taller whenever I try to get close to him, why, my nose knocks him down. <laughs> That's why he backs away. Cop chats with the third. There's only one thing to do. Yes. Got to get a nose job. I'm ready for the last nose job. And so I went to a first-rate nose shrinker. <laughs> there you are, Mr. Shotsworth. From now on, your nose wouldn't hold enough niggers for a local phone call. Thank you very much, Doctor. <laughs> Julius, my son. Who are you? Why, I, I, I'm your dad. Foster Farthington Chatsworth. The third. Right. Dad, you, you, you got a short nose. Yes, son. Now I can get close to you. And I can get close to you. Oh, oh dad, I've missed you so no, 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 no. It was my fault, son. I've been short-sighted and long-nosed. Oh, Dad. Julius, my son. Only a nose. I And so you have heard Rock Around My Nose, specially adapted for the Lux Audio Theater. 
And now here in our very own green room with me are the stars of this lovable production, Mr. Evanston, Illinois, and little Bobby Finster. It's a great honor to have you in the green room, Evanston. Well, it's a great honor to be in the green room, C.B. And that was a delightful performance you just gave, Bobby. Well, I felt that, uh, you know, it was a challenge, C.B. <laughs> well, you met that challenge beautifully for an eight-year-old boy. Um, I think we can knock off that eight-year-old boy routine any time now, you know. Uh, Look, I'm a 37-year-old midget with a wife and three kids in Kansas City. Uh, <clears throat> in that order. <laughs> uh, tell me, Evanston, how did it seem to be working with little Bobby Finster again? Perfectly miserable. <laughs> well, surely you're joking. It wasn't exactly a picnic for me, Mr. Evanston. Has been, Illinois. What do you mean, has been? Ah, oh, come on, you big ham. What? If you hadn't gotten this job tonight, they would have turned off your gas. Why, you vicious little monster. Hey, take your hey, hands off me, you old goat. Let the boy have me alone. Kick him in the teeth. We're oh, having a little fun here in our very own green room tonight, folks. I see our time is up. Now, next week... Who cares about next I... week? How much do I get paid for next week? Shut up, Mr. Shut uh, up. Uh, uh, what is for next week, right. Hey, what you doing after this show, baby? Yeah, what, what you doing with that cigar? Keep away from her, you so friends. Lock, lock, <laughs> the only salmon-shaped <laughs> bar that swims up tub has brought you another formal interview in our very own little green room. Right. Next week, we present... I love thy neighbor. Mr. C.B. Digby saying... Take your foot out of my mouth. <laughs> Good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> uh, in Mr. Uh, H. Allen Smith's book, The Rebel Yell... There seems to be some dispute among Southerners as to uh, how the actual Southern rebel yell went. Uh, Mr. Smith points out that there are certain schools who believe it went uh, ha, yip, 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 wahoo, and uh, other people down there think that it went uh, tutti fruity, tutti fruity, a wop bambooey. But uh, I personally, uh, having done a little research on the subject, uh, believe that the rebel yell went like this. Let me startle you. I'm just doing a rebel yell here to kind of kick things off. You know what I mean? There's Yellow Rose in Texas, and I am going to see. Nobody else could miss her, not half as much as me. That's right, so when I... Excuse me. That's just a shade loud on the snare drum. She's the sweetest little rosebud that Texas ever knew. Her eyes are bright as diamonds. Sparkle like the dew. See, now you covered up sparkle like the dew. One of the loveliest parts in the whole Texas is the only girl for me. You covered up the piccolos there. Where the Rio Grand? Where the Rio? Where? My feeling is that whilst I love the good snare drum, I feel that volume-wise it's just a little bit too much what you're doing there, see? See what I mean? See what I mean? Now you trying to hold it down, will you? Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Where the Rio brand, appreciate it. Where the Rio brand is blowing, and sorry, it's got that better. She walks along the river, and the client, oh, that's so much better. But oh, that she remembers when the part is long ago. Oh, that there's just a world of difference. <gasps> Mercy, she's Oh, now I'm going to find her, for my heart is full of wool. We'll do the best.
playing together We did so long ago We'll play the banjo gaily Excuse me, you ain't any kin to the snare drummer, are you? Sweet as little Rufus at Texas Avenue Her eyes are fast How do you do that? Why do you first stop like that? There, take me There, take me, that's all From the yellow rose of Texas Hold on Yankee drummer, you. Yeah. Listen, you can cover up yellow, and you can cover up rose, buddy, buddy, but don't you cover up Texas. <laughs> what I mean to say you cover up Texas. <laughs> I'll stick your head through that cotton-picking snare drum and see seed from the band, so help me Mitch Miller, I will. And the yellow rose of Texas will be fine forever. He ruined the ending. <laughs> One of the loveliest parts in the whole piece. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that's about it for this time around. I'll be back next week with a new throat. Crazy. Oh, yes, I forgot about you. Well, you've, uh, you've tried our show. Yeah, man. And uh, you've tried other shows. Yeah, man. Well, uh, what is your conclusion? Well, your show is louder, man. It bugs me. And it's, and it's more piercing. Definitely more piercing. Thank you. So until next week, this is Stan Freeberg saying thanks for listening, God bless you, and good night. The Stan Freeberg Show is produced in Hollywood by Pete Barnum and is written by Stan Freeberg, Pete Barnum, Jack Roach, and Doris Butler with original songs by Stan Freeberg. Featuring the music of Billy May, Judd Conlon through the mayors, and the songs of Peggy Taylor with Dawes Butler, Peter Leeds, and June Foray. Also in the cast of Hans Conrad, Bud Sewell speaking. <laughs> <laughs>